hello everyone. I think we could start already. We're a bit late. But anyway, uh, I would like to welcome you all in front of Subversi Festival and Subversi Forum and Transform Network, who is one of uh, also our partners who help us to organize uh, these two days uh, discussions. Uh, I won't take much time. What I would like to do is to present a solidarity appeal uh, with Frankfurt, which we will send in front of the Subversi Festival and Forum and all participants here. Uh, so maybe I will just pass the word first to Thomas and then to Barbara Steiner from, from Transform. So Thomas, if you can. Yeah, I think most of you know the stories in principle, so I don't have to repeat it. Shall, shall I read the declaration? Oh, you can read it. OK. Yeah, yeah. So I just will uh, read the declaration. The, I will immediately after that, I will send it uh, by email to Frankfurt because uh, the movement will have a press conference at 11 PM, and they will present that. Uh, on the press conference, and it will be signed by all the participants, and some of the more prominent names will be singled out in order to get into the German media. That is one thing we have to do. So I just will read the, the declaration. It's declaration of protest and of solidarity with Blockupy Frankfurt. While capitalist crisis is constantly moving ahead, Germany is always one step step ahead of all competi competing powers. Whereas the Greek, the Spanish, and the Italian government still leave the space for rallies, demonstrations, and assembleas protesting against the crisis regime, the days of resistance organized by the Blockupy Frankfurt movement has been banned. Also banned is the Occupy camp existing since months, and even more than that, hundreds of individuals have been banned even to enter downtown Frankfurt from May 16th till May 19th. Besides that, if somebody is breaking these of these hundreds of individuals, they will be fined by 2,000 euro if police arrested them in Frankfurt downtown. So now, we, the participants of the subversive forum in Zagreb, strongly condemn the anti-democratic politics of the German and especially of the Frankfurt city authorities. But for us, this ban is not only one more step forward in the ongoing deprivation of social and political rights. It is a clear sign that the ruling powers of the Troika and the Fiscal Pact now are in an open hysteria. This means that the Blockupy movement has already prevailed. This is a good sign for the social movements all over Europe. All Europe is already falling apart, and Germany here again is one step ahead. Blockupy Frankfurt is the beginning of another Europe, the Europe assembling today on the squares of Madrid, of Athens, and of Frankfurt. The ban on Blockupy Frankfurt has to fall and it will fall, we the participants of the subversive forum. That would be the declaration which will be presented to the media on the press conference in one hour at least. If that is fine for you, just why, I don't know what we can do. This kind of. So I will leave to. Yeah, and to write it. Okay. And send it to my mail as well. Hmm? <laughs> to my mail as well. Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, just a technical information today and tomorrow we don't have simultaneous translation, uh, but we will have it on Thursday and Friday. Uh, I will pass the word now to Barbara Steiner from Transform Network. Hello, good morning. Um, uh, I want to thank you uh, to have the honor to welcome you on behalf of Transform here at the Subversive Forum in Zagreb. I thank the organizers and all people involved in the organization. Um, I want to be uh, very brief in order to leave space for the very interesting debates. So um, just a few words on Transform. It is a network of 22 left scientific organizations and periodicals all over Europe, not only EU, and uh, out of 17 countries. And uh, Transform has the aim to uh, build a ground for a whole European left dialogue. And uh, working uh, 
together with the, the movement, with the um, European Left Party, which um, um, recognized foundation transform is, together with the trade unions, together with all activists to, for a refoundation of Europe. And uh, in this, um, um, well, Europe is now in, a, we hear it all the time here, and it is also the topic of our debate. Today, Europe is in a deep crisis. It's very tense times at, at the moment. So um, the crisis in Europe is not just a crisis of uh, the economic system and financial market. It's um, also like a, a kind of oligarchic rule um, is opposing um, authoritarian course of austerity on all European countries. And so the aim, what we are living, what we are seeing now of um, the ruling classes is like a final destruction of a so European social model of the um, working rights. It is um, like we see um, on the one hand um, more and more impoverishment of of people, and uh, what we also can recognize is that uh, the Western lifestyle and the ideology of growth is coming to a limit, not only in ecological terms, but also when we look at exploitation in new colonial way of uh, southern countries. So um, just very brief, the elections in, in France gave hope. Somehow Sarkozy is... Uh, voted against. So the Merkel-Sarkozy axis um, in Europe is broken, but um, we will see if also these policies are broken. So, and in, in Greece, the, the, we have seen a political earthquake. Um, the left alliance, the left party alliance Syriza being second uh, force in Greece now with 16%. And uh, the two um, strongest components of Syriza, Nesunas Pismos and Akua, um, being both uh, members of European Left Party, they have uh, always stand for a strong opposing of the fiscal pact, of the neoliberalism, of the financial market capitalism. And the vote of the Greek people is a sign, it's a they voted against the fiscal pact, against the austerity measures, against uh, this uh, radical neoliberalism. And uh, so it is, um, in our opinion, very important to uh, respect the vote of the Greek people. It is important that in Europe, it's now this vote is not like um, ignored. And um, the EU has to change its politics Otherwise, it will implode as the Soviet Union did. And another Europe, a refoundation of Europe, is necessary, and it is possible when the people decide that they wish so. So thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Deo. We'll have plenty of time uh, over these two days to discuss all these issues raised uh, in your introductory note. Uh, just uh, to, to explain how this will function, this is not going to be a series of statements. We want to have a discussion and we want to have a discussion with you. Uh, so don't consider this artificial divide between the scene and uh, the audience. Uh, you can always ask questions, raise hands. There will be mics going, going around. What we want to do here is basically start where we uh, start very quickly with the short statements uh, of our panelists who will then give us uh, a lot of material to think, continue discussions and then bring you uh, uh, as the audience and individuals into the whole debate. So with, without, um, uh, obviously uh, here we are discussing the crisis in Europe that has become a buzzword over 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 last uh, uh, three, four, or five years. We'll try to discuss what is actually wrong with Europe on this panel, and then we'll move to European resistances or possibilities of the resistance, such as one we see these days, uh, well, attempts 
at resistance that we see these days in Frankfurt. Uh, we'll, we'll also try to think about another Europe. Everybody's talking about we need another, another Europe. We want to, to have some answers. We have a lot of smart people here, so I'm sure that there will be some answers what kind of Europe we want. And of course, we'll, we'll tomorrow move to the role of the European left, to the questions of democracy that's been asked uh, over and again. And finally, we'll come back to the periphery where we are right now, uh, in a quite an interesting geographical situation, being in Zagreb, uh, the, in a country that will soon join the European Union, but is still outside of the European Union. And as, as you know, the Schengen border is just basically outside of this theater, 10 kilometers from, from here. So I'll start immediately with a question. I'll start with uh, Bernard Cassin. The question is, what's wrong with Europe? What suddenly happened that Europe doesn't work? <clears throat> Obviously, there is something wrong. The problem is to try to locate where it is wrong. I'll ask myself and, and ask yourself a few questions because I have no, not the answers to all of them. First thing is, what is it to be a European? And. Uh, for example, does a Spaniard feel closer to uh, uh, um, Lithuanian, for example, than to an Argentina? It's, it's a question. Or do we feel closer to North Africa when we are in the southern part of Europe than closer to Poland? So uh, the, there are volumes of books, uh, of libraries, uh, which deal with this. Uh, the fact, what is it to be a European? Is it a, a common values? But if freedom, etc. But the, we have that, those values in common with other parts of the world. Uh, and in any case, the, how does our Europeanity reflect on the institutions of the EU? Is Europe the same thing as the EU or not, etc.? That's a, f a f first series of questions. The second thing I want to, to stress is that for the first time in 60 years, national politics, European politics, have burst, have broken into the national sphere. For a long time, what we call the European construction was done far away, was regarded as something foreign, and even in the structure of the ministries, uh, in France in particular, but I suppose it's very much the same elsewhere. The Ministry of European Affairs is situated within the Ministry of International Affairs, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So Europe seems to be part of foreign affairs, which is not the case. For the first time, we have seen that, um, that the decisions taken at European level uh, erupt into the national sphere. Uh, th those of you have mentioned, what, what's happening in Greece, in Spain, Portugal, is a matter of not only for these particular countries, but for the whole of Europe, and vi vice versa. Vice versa, the decisions taken in Brussels impact on, the national, on national politics. Another key point for me is democracy. Someone said it was an Englishman that I don't remember who it was, said that if the European Union was a candidate to membership of the European Union, it would be refused because it doesn't, it, it doesn't meet the conditions to be a member, for Croatia, for example, to be a member of the European Union. I will not <clears throat> make a lecture about the institutions, but if there is a question and answer period, we'll answer that. But, so we have, to, to sum it up, we have De representative democracy at national level with diminished powers, and we have no democracy at European level with considerable powers. And as to the question of identity, uh, I think one curious thing is the banknotes, the euro banknotes. Well, you, you probably have that in a, in a, few, in a few months or years, <laughs> but ha have you looked closely at them? They are completely outside the real world. They, they, they are not European. You have bridges, you have doors which open onto nothing. 
completely, there are no European figures, and we, it's true that we have lots of them in, in our history, in the art, in music, and literature, etc. So this, this is an, an excellent symbol of a, a Europe which has no identity, which doesn't claim its, its part in the history of Europe. We, of course, we have different histories. This is perhaps why. Uh, the, the, it was difficult to, to, to single out some Victor Hugo, Beethoven, Mozart, uh, uh, Dante, etc. But we, we have a, a sort of a symbolic representation of the technocratic functioning of the uh, EU. And to, to finish, I would say that the, the question, what is it to be a European? Does Europe exist? What is absolutely sure is that European networks existed and for the elites and continue existing. We are part of it. We, but uh, you, you have the example of the Republic of Letters, of the Enlightenment, you have the trade fairs, the, the abbeys, etc. There are plenty of networks from the Middle Ages onward. But Europe has failed to go down into the peoples. The, you have a Europe of the elites, and we are part of these elites. But uh, we, uh, these elites have had little grasp on the peoples, on the nations. And Europe has, has systematically tried to dismantle the, the national polity, uh, but, to repl but not replaced it by a European polity which remains to be constructed. I think someone really best placed to maybe give us an answer to some of the questions you ask is Samir Amin, who is European, <laughs> Middle Eastern, African, and who, who sees Europe from within and from outside. So, Samir. Thank you. No, I'm certainly not going to give answers to the questions which are, in my opinion, very uh, relevant and, 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 and central that um, Bernard raised. Um, I don't know if it was a good idea or a bad idea to have me on this panel, being a non-European and probably for that reason, among others, knowing far less about Europe than you, each of you know. Uh, I, I therefore look at Europe from outside. Um, as part of the world, Europe is part of the world, and the Eurozone within Europe is part of Europe but part of the world. Now, therefore, I think that we have to start from, from the uh, global frame uh, before moving into the European uh, and infra-European, the whole Eurozone uh, uh, aspects of the crisis. Now, what I'm going to say uh, in a telegraphic word uh, way, and probably I apologize for those who happen to have read some of the things I have written, um, it will not be new. Point one, uh, the capitalist system has entered a new stage uh, qualitatively different from it, what it was had been before. Um, that is, in a short period between 1975 and 1990, 15 years, uh, the centralization of the control, control, not property, of capital has moved up uh, and change qualitatively from the various patterns of monopoly capital, which is not new, uh, which had uh, already 150 years uh, history behind, to a new stage which ought to be qualified. In that new stage, what is qualitatively new is that monopoly capital is controlling everything. That is that there are no more economic activities which are relatively autonomous from, the con from that control. That is qualitatively new, and that is what has created the conditions for that pattern of management of not only the economy, but also the politics and the society, exclusively by monopoly capital without, uh, without uh, concessions and without uh, uh, historical compromises with other fo social forces, including capitalist forces. That is, and therefore I derive from this, uh, this uh, analysis of the change 
that uh, capitalism at the present stage cannot be but what it is. It cannot be, we cannot move, uh, uh, come, go back to what it was before uh, and dream of uh, what it was before. We have to look to beyond it, which means that um, there is no answer to moving out of the crisis without starting moving out of the logic of capitalism, uh, which, uh, which calls for much audacity from the radical left to have strategies, develop strategies, which look beyond uh, moving out of the crisis. And that goes for, uh, for all, at all levels from global to the national or even the local levels, uh, and the European as well as the uh, European countries, members of the European Union, and, and some others also. Um, now, uh, that is point two or point three. The next point is that this system is imploding, is imploding out of its internal contradictions, which, uh, which um, have two facets at least, many facets, but two at least. One is a, uh, the facet of being a uh, social struggles, and I would call them class struggles, moving up uh, everywhere in the world, north, south, east, west, uh, everywhere. And second, international uh, struggles, that is struggles among the ruling classes that, is, that are the partners in that uh, globalized monopoly, uh, I call it generalized monopoly capital to qualify it as different from the previous stages of monopoly capital. And we have the two. Uh, this implosion um, is, um, is reflected in the growing uh, conflict I say conflict, not only contradiction, conflict between the, uh, the uh, uh, nucleus of the, uh, of the uh, triad, uh, uh, historical imperialism, North America, Europe, and Japan, and some of the emerging, or the emerging countries to various degrees, and China, number one. Um, uh, the growing conflict, which is, uh, which is uh, the reason for the uh, war strategy uh, uh, chosen by the triad and its leader, the US, uh, particularly with the Middle East, but not only that region. Um, uh, and and we, we should therefore see it at those two levels. The fourth point comes to, to Europe. Now, I fully uh, endorse what uh, Bernard has introduced as questions, uh, serious questions. Uh, to my, own, my vision of Europe, Europe does not exist. Uh, there is a European uh, uh, in, in set of institutions, uh, but there is no legitimacy, popular legitimacy of a Europe. Uh, popular legitimacy doesn't move beyond uh, the frames of uh, national states. Uh, and therefore, democracy and the struggles, the democratic struggles, uh, and the class struggles developed within uh, those, even if they interfere, of course, they, uh, they are not independent, in fact, but they, are not, they have no legitimacy at that level. That, that is a, a major problem. Now, um, this, system, this system is imploding precisely for the reason which uh, uh, Bernard in his question indicated. That is, uh, uh, there is a... a, a, a total non-democratic pattern of organization of Europe, an enemy of democracy. Europe is the enemy of democracy. Uh, I don't know if you can, we can dream of another Europe, we can always dream and it's not necessarily bad, but uh, how to change it without uh, disobeying to it at least, but disobeying not only on main, minor questions such as whether it would be allowed or not to smoke in, in rooms, but uh, on major questions. For instance, for instance, and I give only one instance, uh, I want to take very seriously the victory, a number of victories, and I, 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 I'm indicating those in Europe because I could indicate elsewhere also, uh, the victory of Hollande in France, the victory of uh, Syriza in Greece, it, it, immense uh, uh, victory important, uh, but um, taking the case of Hollande, Hollande said that it is a scandal, he said that, 
It is a scandal that the Central Bank of Europe lends to the banks at 1%, that the banks lends back to the government at 7 or 8% or so. Um, now, if he is courageous enough, he should say, okay, if uh, nobody is prepared to renegotiate the status of the central bank, what a country like France can do? Well, it can nationalize its banks and compel them to re, uh, re, uh, uh, um, uh, re uh, um, lend to the French state at 1.2%, whatever they get from the central bank at 1%. How this will be received in Europe and what echo and what uh, chaos it would create or not create, et cetera, et cetera. We can give uh, examples um, of that kind. And therefore, we ought to, therefore, to relate the uh, uh, answers and the strategies answering the, uh, the um, crisis in uh, various countries of Europe and in Europe in the frame of the global crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samir. Uh, now we'll, we'll move to, the, to, to someone, so two people who come from the very heart of Europe, uh, of, uh, from Brussels. Uh, we'll start with uh, Francine Mestrum, who worked a lot on globalization and poverty. So to, to address some of the questions raised by our friends Bernard and Samir. Thank you, good morning. Um, to give an answer to the first questions, I come from Belgium, which is a small country, and I think that is one of the reasons we may, one of the reasons we may differ on a couple of points. Um, small countries look differently at international institutions in general. That is one thing. The second question on this Europe, European Union. I would like to stress that Europe does not exist except as a geographical entity. We have a European Union, which is an economic and political project born after the Second World War. That project is now failing, is now imploding. That should be clear. Why? It is not only because of the financial and economic crisis we have today, the crisis of capitalism. The crisis in the European Union started well before. In fact, the real crisis in the European Union started in 1989 with the fall of the Berlin Wall. That was a major point of crisis, also because the new member states of Central, Central uh, Europe who came into the European Union obliged us to look at a, in a different way to our own past. That was a very difficult moment for all European member states. The second element of the crisis was the Treaty of Maastricht, because that was a neoliberal turn in the European Union. And then, of course, in 2007, in 2008, the start of the crisis of capitalism and of our financial system. Now, there is one thing I want to stress, and probably it is one thing on which, after all those years, we still differ. <laughs> um, we, we were together in the campaign against the European Constitution in, uh, what was it, 2005? Um, so we have no differences on that. But the point is that we should never forget that European policies from the beginning till the end are the policies of our national member states, of our national governments. They are the ones who decide. They are the ones who take all the decisions. They are the ones who created the, the central bank, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, it is not so much that Europe interferes into national politics, it is national politics interfering in European politics and making European politics almost impossible. And one of the other elements, uh, it will be my, my, my last word in this introduction, one of these other elements of, of the failure and of the implosion of the European Union project today is precisely the situation of Germany. 
because we should not forget that one of the reasons, I al al always used to say, as in mythology, Europe has many fathers. It is not only a child, it is a child of capitalism, absolutely, but that is not the only explanation. It is all also, um, also one of the others, um, it, it, it was an attempt to, to rearm Germany and to kind of harness Germany within a European whole in balance with France, but also with the other countries, which was small, well, Italy is not a small country, but then you had the Benelux, Belgium, Holland, and, and Luxembourg. That has failed. Today we see again a German hegemony and a German economic power that is not compared, not comparable to any other member state of the European Union. And I think that is one of the main failures of today and one of the main factors of the crisis. And there we are. I think today this whole project is indeed imploding. It is not a matter of it has never been democratic. Of course, there are many elements of democracy. The whole, the whole point of discussion with democracy, I, I see a certain paradox because on the one hand, critics of the European Union say the European Union is like becoming a state. And we are against that. At the same time, they criticize the European Union because it does not have the same democratic institutions as a normal state. So there is a certain paradox. And I, I think, of course, there, there are serious democratic deficits in the European Union. Absolutely, there are democratic deficits. Um, but again, for, 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 for many points, these are linked to the influence of our national member state, of our national governments. And as long as our national governments remain neoliberal, we will have a neoliberal European Union. I mean, these points are linked. So I keep it to that in my introduction. Thank you very much, Francine. Uh, moving to another Belgian, uh, Eric Toussaint, who uh, the expert on debt and on economic issues. Uh, we are happy to have you here. Maybe you will help Subversive Festival to get rid of our debt, but <laughs> we'll talk about it later. Uh, so, so how the the. The debt is all, all around. All, all European countries seem to be heavily in debt. How do you see this crisis, where, where, where it started and where it could go? I'm very happy to be with you this, this morning. And as I told you yesterday, that's the second time that I'm in Zagreb. The first time was in February 1994. And I was going, uh, traveling to Sarajevo to support the uh, multi-ethnic resistance in the war. And so for me, that's a lot of souvenir, uh, being here with you in Zagreb, in participating to the Subversive Festival. Uh, about the debt in Europe, uh, I would say the main point uh, to, uh, to emphasize is that uh, the main problem is the private debt, the private debt of banks. The main uh, uh, link which is uh, uh, very fragile are the private banks, the big private banks. Deutsche Bank, BNP Paribas, Credit General, uh, the big European banks are uh, uh, hugely indebted, and uh, the medias and the government are uh, trying to convince the people that the real problem is sovereign debt, public debt, the public debt of Greece, uh, for instance. And they say if Greece default, uh, it will provoke uh, a new uh, uh, banking uh, crisis, when in reality uh, we don't have to see uh, Greece defaulting, defaulting to have a banking crisis. Uh, four months ago, for the second time in three years, the French-Belgium uh, 
big bank Dexia uh, bankrupt uh, and it should, should have been uh, bailed out by the states of France, uh, Belgium and also Luxembourg for a very huge uh, price. So the question in Europe is that uh, the private sector, the private capitalist sector is transferring its private debt to the public sector. And it will create, for sure, a big problem for the states and the government. And the capitalist class is using now the increase of the public debt to say we should uh, launch a new offensive of austerity. So I would say the, the European government and the European Commission and the IMF now are using the actual crisis to, I would say, finish the work which began with Margaret Thatcher in uh, 79, uh, 1979, 80, in Great Britain, and which uh, have a, a big uh, influence in, in Europe. Uh, one point I, I would uh, say also is that we don't have to underestimate our enemy. And uh, for me, I would not say uh, that the European Union is imploding. Uh, it's clear that it's a failure at the level of the perspective of a good integration, etc. But uh, we don't have to underestimate the capacity of the dominant classes, the capitalist classes, to use the crisis uh, to uh, uh, increase its profits and to increase its capacity to exploit the, the working class and, uh, all, and the majority of the population in Europe. And, uh, I finished telling that uh, it's very important for me to see that uh, at the level of uh, alternative, uh, it's very important to say we don't, as, as uh, people, we don't have to pay an illegitimate debt. And for instance, if a coalition, a radical left coalition like Syriza in Greece succeeded the 6th of May, to uh, multiply by four its, uh, its votes, and having uh, like 17% uh, of the votes, and now in the polls, if the Greek people would have to vote, it seems that they will give 25% of the vote to the Syriza coalition. Is that why Syriza told to the Greek people, if we are in the government, as a left government, we will stop all the austerity plans and we will stop the reimbursement of the debt. Meanwhile, we are organizing an audit of the debt to identify the illegitimate debt and to repudiate it. That's because they give a very radical message to, which gives some real alternative to the people that they receive the vote. And that's the reason why now in the discussion is Greece is how to avoid new election. Because if there is, there are new election in June, uh, Syriza will be the first party. And we will have the prime of 50 deputies more as the, the first party. What uh, new democracy has succeeded in uh, having uh, after losing uh, one million votes, they gain deputies because of the rule uh, in, in Greece which says the first party uh, receive 50 deputies more than the others. Uh, and I stop saying that uh, maybe if you ask me, you didn't ask me, I, I, I imagine, if you ask me, does Croatia should enter the Eurozone, I would say, Absolutely, you don't have to enter the Eurozone. Uh, 
in the Eurozone you will enter in very huge problem as Croatia. So please try to convince yourself and to convince the folk of Croatia not to enter the Eurozone. Uh, uh, because if you enter the Eurozone, you will abandon uh, the margin of maneuver you can have as a sovereign state with its own money. Thank you. Own currency. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we raised a lot of issues from the identity issues to, to, to the economic issues. I suggest now that we do another quick round on a on couple of, of, of questions and then we can, we can include uh, the audience as well into, into, into our discussion. Uh, obviously, Europe has, has many faces and we heard this here as well, uh, all, and also many different perceptions of Europe. They would say that, you know, for Germany, Europe was always just an you know, enlargement of a federal state. For France, more of an embodiment of the idea of Europe where France would have a strong cultural influence. For Britain, it was always a bit outside. For countries like Italy and Greece, it was corrective of the local politics. For the Balkans, it was perceived as the only remedy to nationalism and conflicts. So we obviously perceive Europe differently from different corners of Europe. Today, many people do go back to this idea that Europe became just a Germany's, you know, Germany's backyard or some kind of enlargement of the federal state so that Europe is governed the way Germany is governed. Uh, uh, we should definitely go maybe address the issue, and I'll ask Bernard, they address the, this issue of smaller and, and, and larger states and the maneuver that Belgium, or certainly Croatia, do, do not have, uh, the maneuver that France possibly could have, or the influence that could have. On the other hand, uh, a periphery is not obviously reduced only to, 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 to victimhood, yeah? like Greece. The, the only alternative, actually, is not the election of Hollande, but the alternative is the election of Syriza happening just out of uh, the blue and, and basically pointing out uh, a direction that many countries might want to follow. So, Bernard. the position of the smaller states uh, because history has, uh, has taught us that uh, most of them were in the sphere of influence of larger states which exercised their, their power. And in this respect, the institutions of the EU give a tremendous advantage to smaller states. It's not proportional representation. They have more votes than their actual weight in the, in the institutions. But I would like to answer to some of the points which uh, uh, Francine ma ma made. Uh, it's absolutely true that European politics are the conjunction of national decisions. Those who, who make decisions, who decide at, at European level, are the members of the Council. Uh, that's true. But they do that uh, on the base of proposals which are exclusively made by the, the European Commission, which is a totally ir irresponsible body, which answers to no one, just as the central. So what did the states do? They, uh, they used the umbrella of Europe to, to make decisions which they knew would be absol absolutely impossible to make at national level, and say afterwards, well, of course, it's a bit painful, but it's Europe. And who is against Europe here? We are all Europeans. So the mechanisms of the EU were used to, <coughs> to impose unpopular policies at national level. And the responsibility of the, of the national states is total. But there is no other source of legitimacy than the, the national state. Europe is a concept. It doesn't exist. So. What is striking is that at the same time that uh, the e EU pretends to defend the uh, European model of some of sorts, in fact, it, it's, it's imposing a sort of uh, sub-model of, gl of globalization. In many instances, and particularly at the uh, W, uh, the, the World, the, the world 
the WTO, European negotiators are much more liberal than their US counterparts. So uh, Europe is a really on the vanguard of, of liberalism, of neoliberalism, in international institutions and in, in its relations, in particular with the South, in particular with, with Africa. So, uh, as I said, there are more questions than, than answers. It's quite clear that, is, that there is no other uh, source of legitimacy at the moment than, the, than, than nations. The idea of building of, of a European public sphere, of a European consciousness, is certainly a good idea, but it, it will take uh, one, two, three generations to build, because uh, so far, uh, Europeanness is limited to the elites uh, and include the students, the engineers, the, the, the researchers, uh, journalists, uh, uh, activists like us, but it doesn't go deep into the peoples. And I, I think that one of the things to do, one of the things to, to build that consciousness, which is certainly desirable and terribly difficult because of our different historical trajectories of our di different languages, we are obliged to, to speak a, a common language, which is English. Uh, and uh, I think it's a, a very bad idea for Europe to have the same language as the United States. Uh, in, many, in some instances, I have suggested that if there was to be a, a European language, it would be Italian. Uh, France it has been a colonial power. So has Portugal, so has uh, Spain. But Italy, well, with a few exceptions, <laughs> with a few exceptions, Italy doesn't threaten anyone. It's not a, it's not a, 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 a world powerful language. And I, I think Italian should be a, a very good idea with Rome, the Pope, etc. Well, you have plenty, <laughs> plenty of, our, uh, plenty of, of, plenty of our, our arguments. So uh, uh, at the same time, if we define ourselves as Europeans, uh, if there are European policies, and these policies are the policies of globalization, what's the point of Europe then? If it's, it doesn't propose something different to the outside world, and we are proposing something which is not in no way different from the rest, from the US and from uh, the, the, the West in general. There is no European uh, spe specificity. And that's, uh, and uh, perhaps in the discussion we can mention another ongoing construction in Latin America, which is ALBA. You know what is ALBA? In Spanish it's, uh, uh, no, Alianza. Alianza Bolivariana para los Pueblos de Nuestra America. The Bolivarian Alliance for the Peoples of our, of our America. Our America is a phrase from uh, Marti, the, the Cuban uh, uh, hero. Uh, it's a different thing. It's a construction uh, the, the, uh, which is dictated by politics. What are the objectives? Decent work, uh, preservation of the environment, the reduction of poverty, etc. And the, the, there is no, no obligation each state re con re keeps its independence. There is a recognition that there are states which cannot pay, others we, 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 which have wealth, such as Venezuela, because of what. But I'll detail that later on if you will. So it's not, the EU is not the only possible model. There are other models, and the examples of Latin America are extremely important for us to follow. Mm. Samir, yeah. you'll certainly have. Uh, it's a short, uh, a short addition, perhaps, or comment on what uh, Francine has said. Well, uh, some time ago, Karl Marx um, wrote about the state, not the state exclusively as the police for the ruling class, but the state in the capitalist society as uh, managing the competition among capitals. That is, the state is necessary in order to go, and the state goes against capital, in order, capitals in plural, in competition among themselves, in order to create the, the dynamic for capitalism as a uh, whole system, integrated system. That is, there is a contradiction between that role of the state 
without which capitalism cannot uh, be imagined or was not, and competition. And uh, the, um, the ideology of neoliberalism saying competition, competition, competition against the state is leading to nowhere but to catastrophe. Um, that is a, a central point, I think, which should be made. And it explains why. Why, why is it so? It's not a ideological stupidity and deviation. It's the result of an objective change, the one I indicated, that is the move from monopoly capital to generalized monopoly capital, which created the conditions that this generalized monopoly capital is controlling both at, at all national levels in Europe, until it will be questioned by the European people themselves, of course, huh? but until now is ruling and therefore can hide itself behind Europe, which is its own creation. That is, you have this imbalance, this destruction of the major role of, cap of the state for capitalism, in capitalism, to the benefit of capital directly, uh, having directly the management, the responsibility of the management of everything at national levels, creating the conditions for that. I think this is a very important point because I'm not absolutely convinced that the ideology of competition is not accepted, uh, is not accepted by wide opinion, not only the right, but including within, uh, within the left, or at least the uh, leadership of the electoral majorities of the left. Um, and that is a, 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 a central point, I think. Uh, but uh, through the development of the struggles, um, for instance, people don't want austerity, nowhere in Europe, I think. Uh, they don't want it. But uh, they uh, have not yet reached the point where they can destroy the institutions which impose that austerity at national and at European levels. Very good. Francine, you created a bit of an illusion of a conflict or a debate. Would you like to, uh, to add? Not no, conflict. of course, Stop not conflict. conflict. No. Uh, but, but I want to come back to that point of the commission because you're right. You're right, you're about, absolutely right in what you're saying. But I, I uh, don't believe that the commission can make proposals that are not acceptable for, for the European Council. I mean, it is, uh, they're very, there are many examples today where the commission wants to do something and cannot do it because the council is stopping it. And to give you just a brief example of what this European Council means, because if you think of it, it is an absolutely absurd system. National governments come together, sit around a table in Brussels, talk to each other, come out of the room and say, well, Europe has decided that. I mean, they talk to each other, they decide things, and then they come out and say, well, it is Europe, we, it's not us. I mean, this, this is absolutely absurd. And um, the, this is a very important point about global, or was it you, sorry, about globalization. The, the point is that many people believed that in the globalization of today, capitalist globalization, we need a regional block to address it. And that potentially, the European Union was a good instrument to do it. Because most of the member countries have indeed a colonial past. But that we also have another common characteristic that does not exist anywhere else in the world. And which I still think is very important that we should try to defend it, which is the solidarity systems that we developed in all, our member, in all our member states in the form of social protection, with the universal protection, with organic solidarity. Now, neoliberalism is killing all that, as it is killing democracy. 
for sure. But we had that system, we had the potential to defend ourselves within that um, globalization with this uh, regional bloc. Uh, two more things about identity. You're totally right. The European Union never, never succeeded in, 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 in developing that European identity. It did, take a couple of, it did take a couple of initiatives in its first decades with cultural policies, with solidarity policies, but they were far too limited. And once you take the neoliberal turn, that is against all solidarity against all cohesion policies that may have developed a European identity. The citizenship of the Treaty of Maastricht is empty. The Charter of Fundamental Rights, in fact, does not help us. I mean, you have, within a neoliberal policy, you cannot do anything anymore. It is killing, it is killing everything. Uh, one more last point. Um, talking about states. The whole problem with what I explained about European Council and the Commission being, I have, I've, I have had the privilege of, 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 well, the privilege, yes, <laughs> uh, to have been within the institutions for a couple of decades in, in, different, in the different institutions. And I have seen it change around the, the period of Maastricht and, and um, and then, then uh, uh, the, the Constitution, uh, Constitutional Treaty, uh, where, where during the period of Jacques Delors, with, 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 which launched the, the Maastricht and the Internal Market Initiative, the Commission was very strong. Once the law was gone, slowly, slowly, the Council has taken its place. Now the European Council is a European institution. And that means, and that is very important also for what Samir said about states, because now we have an intergovernmental Europe. It is an intergovernmental Europe, it is a Europe of states. And we had that in the 19th century, we had a concept of Europe that does not work and that will never work. And, and, the Europe, last of, thing, and Europe of states is Europe of non-states uh, because of competition replacing the state Oh, not, o not only that, it is a Europe of financial markets, and therefore, where, where I can follow Eric's point of not, 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 not taking uh, the euro, your sovereignty is not limited by the European Union or by the euro. Your sovereignty is limited by financial markets and by capitalism and by neoliberalism. And that is the whole point that you should never forget. We should not find institutions. We should find fight the, the, this capitalism and this neoliberalism and the, the power of the financial markets. And by the way, the central, the, 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 our national states have the capacity to create money and they should do it. What Greeks should do now is create money. It should create money because our financial system now is based on nothing. It's virtual. It gives real power to banks. It gives real power to financial markets. But there's nothing that limits states or cities or people to create their own money. And that is what we should do to get out of this crisis. We are, Eric, we are here in our new terrain. You mentioned uh, Eurozone uh, and Croatia entering Eurozone. Well, probably the, the good thing about it that no one in, the, in his right mind would accept Croatia as a part of a Eurozone. They're not that crazy. Hopefully, hopefully <laughs> they're not that crazy. But, uh, but let's see. Uh, uh, can you address this issue more? I mean, let's talk about money a bit more. Huh? <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's not so easy because in a few, in a few minutes, because uh, uh, I, I gave a lot of conference on, on that question and I saw uh, that it's not so easy for the public to understand uh, which seem very abstract because it's complicated for people to understand that uh, uh, you can have the same money, the same currency, the, the euro, but the disparities between the countries who have the same currency is so high that it creates a lot of problem for the uh, uh, countries who have not the capacity 
to be a, or to gain the competition with uh, Germany, uh, the Netherlands, uh, France, Austria, Belgium, etc. With the countries, so for the periphery like Portugal, including uh, Spain, Greece, for sure, other countries who enter the Eurozone, at the beginning, including, it seems something positive, because a lot of money came from the German and French banks to the economy of Greece, of Portugal, etc. People could uh, increase the con consumption with credit, uh, so the private uh, debt increase. Uh, you add uh, the bubble in the real estate in uh, Spain, for instance, uh, but also in Hungary. Uh, they were not part uh, of the Eurozone, but for other reasons. Um, okay, so th there was some uh, a good feeling to be part of the real Eurozone. The problem began with the huge, at, at the, what the people saw. It began with Greece in April 2010, when Greece entered the crisis and the Troika, so the European Commission, the IMF and the European Central Bank dictated uh, the first memorandum, which is a very adjustment uh, plan of uh, austerity, uh, like uh, the IMF imposed to the third world countries in the, the 80s and uh, 90s. Uh, so the problem with the, uh, having the same currency in uh, Union where you don't have uh, policies to uh, narrow the disparities between the economies, you know, in, in Europe, inside the European Union, the difference between the salaries in Bulgaria and Romania and the wages in Germany is 1 to 10. If you go to Latin America, it's 1 to 3. So inside the European Union, the disparities are very huge. And so it, when you say uh, the European Union and the Euro Eurozone is in crisis, okay, it's in crisis. But for the capitalist class, it's not so bad. For the G German capitalist class, for the, the Netherlands capitalist class, for the Belgian capitalist class, for the French capitalist class, it's very interesting to have trade with the same currency, with country where the people gain uh, four times five times less than the own workers. Or to have people uh, which are working in Belgium or France, but with contract uh, as Irish uh, workers, with, uh, with an Irish company or a Polish company. So huge disparities, and uh, uh, apparently with the common currency, you you say it's a way to integrate, but in reality, the common currency make uh, the disparities more aggressive, more difficult to... Uh, so you have the problem of the Eurozone, but we don't have to forget the other, all, all the other aspects, the lack of democracy, for sure, and now the new treaty, which is not only for Eurozone, but for 25 uh, members of the European Union, the Treaty on Stability, which says that in the constitution of each state member, you have to say that you cannot uh, have a public deficit uh, superior of uh, uh, 0.5%. Uh, so uh, now, uh, that's the reason why it's also complicated uh, for people like in Croatia because it's not only do we have to enter the Eurozone and, and you say they don't want us, so it's okay. But do you have to enter the Eurozone uh, with this evolution of 
uh, pardon, do, do you have to integrate, sorry, the European Union with what is happening now with the uh, new treaty on uh, stability, uh, which will force your uh, parliament to change the constitution uh, before entering the European Union and to implement permanently uh, uh, austerity uh, policies very uh, aggressive against the, the public services and the wage uh, uh, owners. Okay, uh, ju just one thing, if you allow me. I think it's also complicated because uh, Bernard began uh, on a vision of Europe and uh, uh, Samir and uh, Francine uh, uh, gave, gave their opinion. I, I would give just rapidly my opinion on that. I, I, the problem to, to have the perception of what happened in Europe you have to be in the different part of Europe. For, for clear, for France, for Germany, it's not the same thing to be part of the European Union as peoples, not only capitalist classes, but all the uh, people. And if you are in Portugal, in Spain, Greece, or Poland, etc., it's clear that at the beginning, the integration of the, in the European Union was seen as very positive for a lot of folks. For the Greek, for the Portuguese, for the Spanish, it represents to stop the possibility of dictatorship because they had dictatorship during uh, decades in Spain and uh, Portugal. It seemed that the way of life, the consumption was uh, better integrating the Eurozone, but it was artificial, but it was the impression. And uh, I say that because I traveled to Poland, I was invited, and there is Polish comrades who arrived this morning, uh, and I uh, greeting to the Polish comrades who are here, uh, and they invite me in, in Poland three weeks ago. And I uh, perceived that, for instance, the Polish peasants or uh, Polish people living in the countryside. It could be people who are not working the, the land, but they have land. They gain a lot of money with European money. So they feel, they feel happy now. I, I didn't imagine that uh, before going to Poland. I, I imagined that already Polish people was, were conscious that it was not so positive to be now part of the European Union, but it's not so. So the disparities also at the level of the perception of the people uh, is different from one country to, to another. And so it's very important for us to build a common movement. And this uh, activity of the Service Festival is very important to discuss together how to create an alternative European vision of the peoples against the vision of the capitalist classes and the capitalist powers. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, there's a lot of material to be discussed. I'm sure there will be comments and questions. Uh, we are opening discussion with everybody now. Uh, please, in order to, to, to ensure a, a dynamic um, uh, exchange, please be, be, be short and, uh, 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 and clear and precise. So, any comments, questions? Oh, 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 I think, who was the first? Maybe, maybe, was, was it you? It was back there. Okay, it's Harris and then... Uh, uh, our friend here, and after that, Nicholas. Three very short points, because we will have time to speak tomorrow uh, on the left politics. The first point is that uh, I absolutely agree that we have a Europe of states, but at the same time, we should not forget uh, the real, well, I think that there is an influence also of the European bureaucracy. 
which is not only the European Commission, uh, it is uh, more, uh, more importantly, it is the European Central Bank. And the European Central Bank has the, a status which is, uh, I could say, of the same value or of similar value as uh, some big states. This is one observation. Otherwise, I repeat that I agree that the decisions are taken uh, mainly or absolutely uh, at the state level. Second is uh, the, the question of, of Germany. It's, uh, I don't object to the idea that there is a danger of having a German Europe. Uh, but we must not forget that uh, the European Union is an alliance of different states with uh, what we used to say, and I think we can still say inter-imperialist uh, rivalries, uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, uh, Germany imposes uh, uh, its will to the state, to other states who don't want these policies, uh, because the, the other states really uh, uh, are faithful to neoliberalism. And we should have this in mind when uh, uh, we speak uh, also about the resistance. And the third point is that uh, uh, the, the, the official discourse, uh, the Europeanist discourse from uh, the bodies of the European Union now and from the main countries is uh, funny because uh, being European, uh, being Europeanist, means being neoliberal. And you have uh, 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 an appeal from uh, Van Rompuy, for example, to the Greek people to think uh, uh, about national unity. You see, a, a supranational body asking its components to think nationally in order to, to save Europe. Uh, that, uh, this has the repercussion that uh, we believe, uh, the left in Greece believes that uh, the fight that we give is not a fight for our nation. It is a fight for the whole people in Europe. Okay, hi, my name is Roland. Uh, I have a question uh, concerning the external political relations in Europe. Uh, I mean, um, the top of growing economy of China and the topic of growing economy of India that are influencing our European economy uh, in total uh, uh, is very often raised up by neoliberal politicians and uh, intellectuals. And we are being said that uh, this kind of globalized competition uh, forces us to uh, implement this austerity measure, measures in order to be more competitive. And my question is, what is the actual, how do you think, what will be the actual influence of this uh, growing economies and influences of Chinese and uh, Asian uh, economies on our markets, on our uh, economy? Because also uh, on, on the level of, uh, of re uh, daily life, common day, uh, common day life, we see more and more investitions of Chinese uh, from China, in Greece, in Poland, in other countries. And maybe people have a real feeling that it is something that will affect their position on, on the labor market as well. Thank you. Comrades, thank you for uh, well, a most interesting conversation. Oh, I, 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 I'll be a little bit more skeptical myself. Uh, and maybe a little bit too direct or honest to myself. I kind of see, a, in psychoanalytic terms, a kind of fetishism of Europe uh, amongst you, in the sense that you refer to EU or Europe interchangeably for the most part, and uh, you, you think it outside uh, the, the institutions, it formed it. Maastricht was formative of the EU. To speak of it as something that can be taken out, we have the problem of identity here, no? trying to take out hydrogen from an already cup of water. So uh, to talk of resistance 
within the EU, I think uh, we are falling into a fantasy, the same fantasy of capitalism with a human face, uh, to say the least. Uh, and I, I think, uh, well, I would side more with uh, Comrade Amin when he says that, well, perhaps EU is already dead and gone, and we can, we can think of other forms of solidarity between states. Uh, perhaps the capitalists will have something big to lose, but those who have nothing have nothing to lose. Uh, Well, mine is not a question, it's more of a uh, elaboration, I think, actually, of the previous two points. Uh, one relates to the idea that 1989 marked a crisis of the European Union. I think it gave the European Union a new raison d'etre, if you wish, um, given that it had lost one of its previous, previous reasons for existence with the fall of the, of the Soviet bloc, but I think that it reinvented itself with the idea of the incorporation of the former communist countries within this, uh, well, liberal capitalist market, uh, market ideology. And I think that that has been a, um, the prime motivating force, especially for EU's Eastern expansion. And it continues to be that. This project is alive and well. It refers, it includes the, uh, the project related to, uh, to the creation accession to the EU. So I think that uh, in that sense, we can't really think Europe outside of the neoliberal ideology, given that it was not the European social model that was exported. It was the economic and political governance that was exported. On that note, my uh, second point, um, relates to a bit of skepticism I wish to raise in relation to um, exuberant enthusiasm uh, related to the recent victories of the left or left-leaning uh, coalitions and politicians in Europe. Um, I think that what we need to take into account both in France and in Greece is that uh, these are mostly protest votes, votes against um, National governments, uh, the European Union, or the way that the national governments have handled the European Union, more or less. And that, paradoxically, this may imply that once uh, the economy gets back on track, or once the, the Greek, Greek people start making money, as one of the participants has suggested, those votes might uh, swing back to the right or swing back to the center. Um, so in that case, we need to be rather careful when we're thinking about what uh, these victories mean, especially in terms of you know, what might be uh, possible sites or strategies of resistance, given that some of these politicians, if nothing else, have come um, rather dangerous, well, uh, closer to the populist trend of the left than to, um, let's say, than to this kind of really, really informed criticism of the um, supranational governance that we tend to think of when we talk about resistance. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed all the, all the discussion here, and I think what was kind of rightly pointed out by most of the panelists here was that Europe is imploding. I think that's a very important point, but many people, even people in the streets, people who don't read it, don't study, would come to that conclusion that something is wrong with Europe. So my question would be, is it better to kind of talk about systemic changes or what's the way out, out of this crisis, rather than focusing within the different aspects of the European Union and how these aspects are not working and what's going wrong because I think somehow we might fall in this neoliberal trap of dealing with like consequences of this status quo of, of forces and domination of the neoliberal ideology. And the second question would be, is it when we talk about the way out, so should, uh, uh, shall we be happy really when we see that like some like leftist parties who are not that anti-European as we would like to be, kind of have some success in elections? And is it uh, the way out for the states to just leave the European Union or rather trying to have a more kind of left-oriented states part of the European Union? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we have very interesting comments uh, 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 and, and questions here. Um, I think it will be important to, 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 to address um, um, first, the question of, of uh, composition of, of Europe, or well, Europe, EU, 
and then, then to put it in a, in a wider context. It's not uh, a chance that someone coming from Cyprus very far from the core is asking these questions. Again, the perception of Europe is different, and it's different in Bosnia than in Croatia. Uh, 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 but we, we should also maybe address the question of, of other forces and then come to the question of the left and whether these victories are a sign of a possible change. So what about first starting with the economic questions with Samir and, and uh, Eric, and then after that, two of you maybe can address. Okay, thank you. Well, um, first, a, a, a very uh, one sentence on the curiosity that uh, Bernard suggested of having Italian as the language for Europe. I think the only language for Europe should be, but this is not going to be, Latin and Greek. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so um, that is not going to be so. Um, point one is that the centrality of the central bank, I think I, uh, I stress on that. Because that curious central bank is not a central bank because it's not the central bank of a state. There are, this is why when we speak of Europe of states, taking uh, the extreme view, I say it, it's the Europe of non-states. Hmm? And it is not the central bank of a supranational uh, European state which does not exist. It is a bank which is just a servant, direct servant of generalized monopoly capital. And I submit that this is not viable. So either we tend, uh, we accept it because we cannot change it, or you, the Europeans accept it because they cannot change it, and it will lead to more and more chaos. More and more chaos. Uh, it's a way of disappearing through chaos. Uh, or you struggle frontally for a deconstructing the central bank. Whether, and, and, and since uh, there will be no victory at European level, 27 countries, simultaneous, for those countries which have moved a little ahead to move out of obeying to that central, pseudo central bank. I think there is no, I don't see any alternative strategies. If there are proposals for alternative strategies, I'm of course, uh, would be very happy to uh, listen to, th to the arguments. But I don't, personally, I don't see it. Um, the third point, uh, which is important, the second point, the language is not, <laughs> was a, um, is the conflict between Europe and, say, China and the other emerging countries. I submit that at global level, the major conflict, and I say conflict, not contradiction, is between, not Europe, is between the triad that is US number one and its subaltern allies, Europe and Japan, on the one hand, and I wouldn't say the emerging countries, plural, but China and to a certain extent some of the other uh, emerging countries. Uh, and this is the major conflict, which is the key, which in my reading, allows us to understand the political strategy and the military strategy of, uh, of the triad, which is war, which is war. And I think we have not spoken of that at all. And we cannot understand, in my opinion, the European crisis or the crisis anywhere else in the, any other place in the world, particularly in the Middle East, but also elsewhere without uh, putting it in the frame of that overall strategy of war. It is very important to uh, stress on the, on the uh, link between the European Union and NATO. The European Constitution has a very curious uh, uh, article, a, a, a military alliance which usually is something which can be changed with a leader which is, happens to be a non-European state is part of the constitution. And I don't see that the strategy of, uh, of NATO is uh, on the agenda anywhere in Europe as uh, part of the struggle against uh, 
uh, it is on the agenda of a number of people on the left, huh? but I'm speaking more widely of the uh, left opinion, electoral left, see. Hmm? Uh, it's, it's not. Uh, Hollande uh, has been quite, uh, taking the case of Hollande, quite uh, positive and courageous on the issue of the central bank, has been completely silent on international politics. Uh, Juppé could be the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Hollande. Uh, they, <laughs> nothing will be changed. Just as Obama is continuing Bush, uh, uh, Hollande will continue Sarkozy on international politics, and we can multiply the cases. Therefore, if we don't put, if we don't stress on this link, I think we miss a lot of the, uh, in the analysis of the uh, perspective and therefore, the strategies uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the radical left in Europe and elsewhere. Eric. Thank you. Uh, so, my point on the crisis in the EU, when you say uh, maybe uh, the EU is already dead, I would say don't sell the... Uh, you say that the la peau de l'ours, avant de l'avoir tué, could you help me? I, I am uh, so I don't know, how do you say that in English? No, ne pas vendre la peau de l'ours avant de l'avoir uh, tué. Okay, so don't consider that the beast is already dead. I think this beast could be re really dangerous during years and years uh, because the capitalist class use the chaos and use the crisis for the therapy shock. And they do that very well. They, that's a proof for us. So uh, the, the struggle against this institution is very, I, I think it's very important. The struggle against the new pact, the new treaty, should be a point of the mobilization of our movement, etc. But also, uh, uh, speaking about the, 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 the economic aspect of the crisis and the consequences at the level of our demands, I think that the question of expropriation of the capitalist banks or the private banks, uh, it's a very important uh, demand. Yeah, ten years ago or five years ago, it seems like... Uh, so abstract and radical, why do you say that? Uh, but now, with uh, the, the, the type of uh, systemic crisis of the financial system, the question of transferring the credit uh, private sector to the public sector as a public services under the control of the citizenship is a uh, a concrete demand which is very important, uh, linked with the uh, uh, repudiation of illegitimate debt, uh, citizen audit, etc. And I, I finish with that. It's, it was difficult for me to understand all the intervention, for uh, I didn't manage to, to understand well uh, what have been raised. But I imagine there were a uh, uh, reflection about. Uh, electoral battle and uh, social struggles in the street. I, I think we have to, to have a strategy of com combining the several aspects of the struggle. The, for me, what will happen in Frankfurt is very important, okay? Because we will discuss it tomorrow about the evolution of uh, European Social Forum, etc. I would say, uh, the, the European Social Forum entered in, uh, in a way in a crisis of incapacity to convoke people. And if we succeed in having in Frankfurt uh, 20,000 people of Germany and two or 3,000 people from different countries of Europe uh, uh, demonstrating against the, the decision of the authority, authority, it will be the first common European demonstration of the last years, okay? In, a, in the same place. 
because we had several demonstrations in the street. Like, I, I don't know if you uh, listened to the news of what happened the 12th of May in Spain. Did you listen to that? Uh, something like 100,000 people in Barcelona. Uh, and uh, well, no, the, the organiz organizers say 240,000. Uh, the police say 45. I would say 100,000, it's a huge amount of young people in the street in Barcelona and in a, a dozen of cities in Spain. So the people is mobilizing himself in the street and will try to newly occupy the public space and the street. And it's very important. And we have to combine that with electoral uh, battle also. And I think that uh, the... Uh, victory of Theresa, it's really um, uh, a very important thing. More important than Holland, because Holland, I would say, I name it Holland, Holland de you. It's, it will be more or less like Papandreou. Holland will be Holland de you. Uh, EU also, huh? Holland de you. Okay? And uh, maybe because France is not so peripheral as Greece, it will not have uh, so huge bad consequences for the people in France because uh, France has margin ma of maneuver that Greece uh, has not. Uh, and, and I am happy that Sarkozy is out of uh, the presidency. But uh, for me, it's more important, more positive what happened in Greece because it's a radical change, it, uh, seis seismic change. Uh, in Greece, in electoral level, uh, when it, France is the alternance, normal alternance, and we will have a normal Hollande uh, president for the next years in France. It's better than Sarkozy. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, Francine, maybe you can, you can address, uh, and then later on, uh, Bernard, uh, this question of, uh, 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 of European institutions, and is, is the boat really sinking, and if, if, if people should jump off, but jump off where, or there is nowhere to jump? Uh, so, so, can you address this question? With pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, First of all, I do not think you have to look at European Union as one block where you cannot find any margin for maneuver. That is one thing. Um, also, the point which was mentioned of perception, I agree with it, but I, 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 I would like to point out that these differences also exist within our member states. And I think France, in that, uh, in that respect, was a good example. If you look at the vote for the left and for the extreme right, you see that the extreme right is now winning votes everywhere in the, on the countryside. So you have this, these differences also within uh, member states. Now, the question of change and, and, and how do we go from here? I think this is a, a fundamental question for the left, and I think we should urgently, all of us, tackle that question and see what we can do. In, in grosso modo, how you say it, in, in, <laughs> there are two possibilities. You can say you have this neoliberal European Union, we do not want it, we want it to be a way, so we fight for a socialist European Union or for a socialist whatever. But that is a legitimate point, a legitimate way of working. Or you can say, we have this European Union, we see, and that my personally is, is my point, what is happening now, we have these electoral successes for Syriza, for Mélenchon in France, maybe um, in, in September in, in, in Holland. We have electoral successes, but we also have electoral, not we, <laughs> there also are electoral successes for the extreme right. And I see it in my own country, how fast the extreme right is winning ground. And that really makes me afraid. And I think we have to act against it. So what, 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 what I would like to see whatever systemic change we want, and we want it, 
There's no doubt about that. But I also think we should use all the spaces we have today to be where the debates are taking place. Europe is, is, is not falling apart, I, I, I agree with, with Eric, but we also should know that there are some limits of what capitalism can do, especially today with the financial crisis. There are limits, I mean, from this crisis, we're heading fast towards another crisis, a monetary crisis. That is one, and two, we have our sustainability crisis, we have our climate change problems. So there are limits to what capitalism can do. One, two, people already in the European Union of today, not yet on an institutional, not yet on a formal level, let me call it like that, not yet on a formal level, but at an informal level, are already sitting together to see how they can refound Europe. I think the left should be part of these debates. I think the left should take its place in these debates to have an influence on what is happening. We have always been a part looking from the margin, looking from the side, and looking at what was happening, saying, oh, this is all capitalism. Yes, it was all capitalism, that is true. But we never tried to influence. And I think that even with, I, I agree with, with all the etc. Yes, that's, it, it's, it's all true. At the same time, we should use these margins. We should let our voice heard. We should try to influence things. And from there, we can go on and on and on and try to have the systemic change. But at this moment, we should also realize that we are, in all our countries, a minority. And that is the important point. We are minorities. So I think we should try to make a very attractive, what Mélenchon has done in, in, in France, we should have an attractive narrative, a protective narrative. We should try to convince people that we have solutions that are better than the extreme right-wing solutions. And I think we have to use all the margins we have everywhere, develop a narrative with, with which we can convince people that, yes, we we have solutions, we have alternatives, and we should fight for them, I think. I will not be so proud as to conclude. Uh, I, I largely agree with what Francine said. Uh, as Kane said, uh, we will not live in the, in the long term. People live in the short term, live today. And it's quite clear that at European level, the odds are absolutely against us. But this doesn't prevent us from using whatever margins of maneuver we, we, we may have. For example, supposing we were in the government in France, Mélenchon was were president, what would he do? Uh, I think he would proclaim that France will henceforth disobey the uh, European decisions will not translate into, the, into national uh, law the directives that have been voted in Brussels, etc. Uh, use the empty seat, if, if I may <laughs> say that word, that, that De Gaulle did, uh, used in the, in, the, in the 60s to impose the financing of the common agricultural policy. Use whatever guerrilla tactics we can use within the institutions. Uh, I think, and I think there is a lot to be done, uh, uh, quite, quite, quite a lot, and see what happens. Uh, certainly, there will be a huge European crisis if France says no. We, we, we will not, uh, we will not enforce the directives on liberalisation, etc. Quite, uh, we will not participate in any decision that uh, adds to liberalism, etc. We may refuse the enla some enlargements, but because do not think for a second that when the EU accepts a new member, it does the, fa it does the, the member a favor, not at all. On the contrary, uh, by enlarging Europe, it creates more uh, open trade within Europe, it, it creates more social, fiscal, and environmental dumping. That's the, the whole purpose. And, but I understand the position of, of a country like Croatia, which is, uh, in a way, similar to, the, to, 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 to Belgium. It's, 
it prefers to be within uh, the European uh, environment than in the Bal only in the Balkanic environment, and for reasons that you have quite rightly mentioned. So I think th there are things to be done, and they, they can be done. Uh, whether Hollande will be will turn into, a, as I said, a Roosevelt or a Hollande Réau is, at the moment, not uh, decided. Uh, I fear the worst, uh, to, to be quite frank. But I do not completely rule out uh, another position. Because if, if Hollande uh, submits, capitulates, surrenders uh, in front of Merkel, he's finished uh, politically in France. And we should not overestimate Germany, I think. I think there is a general overestimation. Germany is a declining country in terms of demography. Each year, there are less and less Germans, and there are more and more French. <laughs> within, <laughs> within 20 or 20, 25 years, the, 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 we'll have the same population. And I hope the Belgians will join us in this um, <laughs> creation of European citizens. Uh, the, uh, Germany is entering into recession right now. We don't have to forget that. Uh, uh, the, uh, there is an, an enormous number of Germans who make uh, a, few, a few euros a day. Poverty is gaining ground in Germany. So the, 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 the German model, which depends on exports to the rest of the Eurozone and to the rest, of, this, this model may, 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 may collapse. So if I were Merkel, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too arrogant, all the more so as, as she has been her party has suffered a severe defeat in a regional election yesterday. Uh, but unfortunately, as Samir told me, d link as well. That's, that's so, uh, we have to be uh, pragmatic to, to, to keep our eyes on the horizon. If a crisis arises in Europe uh, due to, Greek, to the Greek government or a French government, I, 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 I think the crisis would be better if it were the Greek government which launches it. Because there would be more social movements behind than in France at the moment. Well, if it so happens that nothing can be done within the EU, we draw the conclusions and do something else. Uh, there is an exit uh, clause in the, in the Treaty of Lisbon. I mean, there are procedures uh, which uh, can be used to, to get out of the EU. There is no procedure to get out of the Eurozone, and you, you can't even be expelled. So one of the solutions which is being put forward by some French economists is that the Bank of Greece, or, or the Bank of France for that matter, receive an order from their government to issue not drachmas or, or, or francs, but euros. And these euros are immediately used to buy back the, 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 the debts. Technically, it's possible. And nothing in the treaty forbids it, because it, it was, it's, they would not even contemplate the idea. But I mean, there are, uh, there are margins of maneuver. This one would be a revolutionary one, but why not? So uh, we must have a, rather a message of uh, hope than of despair, finally. The new avenues are being opened at the moment, uh, which were not opened uh, only a few months, uh, months ago. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Uh, it, precisely, resistances within the institutions and from the street will be discussed at the next panel. So please go have a coffee, smoke a cigarette, and come back here in, in 20 minutes. Thank you.